thank you, Lubna. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I just want to thank you all for joining our session on heart health. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we live and work on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations across Turtle Island. While we meet today on a virtual platform, we must recognize the importance of the land and our treaty agreements. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of all Inuit, Matisse, and First Nations peoples. As our spinal cord injury Ontario community encompasses many geographies, we ask that everyone take a few moments of their day to find out which unceded or treaty territories you may live and work on. You can use the link www.native-land.ca to learn more, and Lubna will put that link into the chat box. Um, so my name is Julie. I'm a peer program coordinator for Spinal Cord Injury Ontario in the London region. Um, my co-host Lubna, who's kind of doing all the admitting and back end stuff, uh, is the manager of our peer program. So we are recording this session today. There's Lubna. <laughs> um, so we are recording this session. You, uh, everyone will be muted throughout the presentation to cut back on the background noise. We will do a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, um, but if you'd like to ask questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, please feel free to do that and we will get to them. Um, so with a grant secured from Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, Spinal Cord Injury Ontario has developed a series of six e-learning courses on aging with a spinal cord injury. You can access these courses by going to cordtree.com and clicking on the Disability Education Center tab. So today, again, we will be talking about heart health. Um, unfortunately, the physiotherapist, Sybil Virgin, who was gonna be with us is unable to, but we still have um, two great guest speakers. So Chris Frazier is a nutritionist and retired registered dietitian who provided nutrition intervention for patients with spinal cord injury and acquire brain injury at the Parkwood Institute site of St. Joseph's Healthcare in London, Ontario for 25 years. She continues to be involved in research initiatives and resource development for persons with a spinal cord injury and is an adapted fitness instructor and member of the program development team for the Parkwood Virtual Fitness Center for People with Disabilities, which Chris will talk to us more about um, towards the end of the presentation. She has written nutrition articles for a number of publications and presented nutrition topics across Canada, including nutrition issues of importance for people with spinal cord injury. Chris lives with a spinal cord injury, which she sustained in 1988. Um, we also have Joan Lewis, who is with us, um, and Joan is here to share her lived experience. Joan sustained a T12L1 spinal cord injury in 1975 and will tell us more about herself later on in the presentation. So Chris, I'll let you take it over from here. Great, thank you very much, Julie. And uh, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, Lubna will be um, putting up some slides for all of us to see. The focus of um, my part of the presentation is going to be um, what we can do with our diets what we may need to eat a little bit less of and things that we can incorporate more of for heart health and cardiovascular health. So um, what's really, I think, exciting to know and exciting for me to share and probably a review for everybody is that um, that's nutrition is something that we have control over. Um, I remember when I had my injury coming up to 35 years ago. And, and you, for those of you out there who've had spinal cord injuries or illnesses that have a, affected your mobility or any aspects of your life, there's a lot of sense of loss of control. So when it comes to our lifestyles, our nutrition, um, th there's a lot that we can do and have control over that have very, very uh, measurable effects, absolutely, and huge impacts on on our on our bodies and our wellness. So um, nutrition, we have the power. Our food choices are powerful tools to decrease our, our risk for many things: um, overweight and obesity, diabetes, 
dyslipidemia, which basically means like high cholesterol or changes and other fats within your, your bloodstream, um, hypertension, which is high blood pressure and inflammation. We know a lot about nutrition and inflammation. And you may say, well, I, I don't have a swollen ankle or a swollen wrist or whatever. What do you mean inflammation? Um, there are certain um, chemicals, not sort of natural chemicals and things that circulate in our bodies that can mean that we have a lot of circulating inflammation or not. And um, diet has a very significant role to play in inflammation. And we now know that inflammation underlies all kinds of chronic diseases that we have control over, like diabetes, like dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and all kinds of things. And nutrition plays such a huge role. So we will be focusing on heart health, but the foods that we choose for heart health also contribute to our brain health and our gut health. Um, which I believe is on the next slide, Lubna, please. I'm, I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Um, so, it, Chris, yes. Chris, if you yes. could just prompt me when you're ready for the next slide. Saying yes, slide. I, I know. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, Lubna. I, I, I get ahead of myself and I get really excited talking about this stuff and forget about the tech part of things. So thank you. Um, so it's dietary fats is going to be our focus today. In addition though, to other foods that we can incorporate into our diets. Um, the good fats, and we're gonna be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good fats and the good foods that we choose literally are good for our hearts, our brains, and our guts that I've just mentioned. So it really is a, a win, win, win. Next slide, please, Lubna. So I'm going to give you your take home messages now before we dig a little bit deeper into what do I mean about dietary fats and what are the good, the bad and the ugly. But here are some thumbnail sketches or, or take home messages for right now. So good fats are liquid at room temperature. So the oils, bad fats, quote unquote, are hard at room temperature. So things like margarine, butter, lard, shortening visible fat on meats and the tropical oils like palm oil, palm kernel oil, um, and coconut oil. There are, there are uh, purported benefits to coconut oil. Um, I have yet to see any research studies to suggest that it contributes to heart health. And um, coconut oil or coconut fat is hard at room temperature as if you've ever had a, a jar of coconut oil. So anything, any type of fat that's hard at room temperature is saturated, and we really should limit those in our diets and replace them more with the liquid fats at room temperature, like the oils. And we'll talk more about oils in a moment. What I refer to as ugly fats are found in processed convenience and fast foods. And um, there are the trans fats in our diets, and we'll talk more about those and the different types of um, foods that they're found in. Next slide, please. More take home messages. So the saturated fat content of foods from animal sources um, can be decreased by different strategies. And um, I, I want to mention that saturated fats can be found in, well, are found predominantly in animal sources. Um, but also in the tropical oils like the palm, palm kernel and coconut oils. Cholesterol, however, is found only in animal sources. So in any type of product that comes from an animal, essentially. But it's really important to note that it's more so the saturated fat in foods rather than the cholesterol in foods that contribute most to heart health or heart disease if we're not making the, the right choices. But the saturated fat content of food from animal sources can be decreased by choosing low fat or fat-free dairy products, removing visible fat from meats and poultry. So if you have a piece of pork chop or a steak or ham, for instance, cutting off the visible fat or the rind, or if it's poultry, 
the majority mm -hmm. of the fat, saturated fat and cholesterol in poultry is in the skin. So if, if you remove the skin, you're automatically eliminating a lot of the fat that is not good for heart, brain and bowel health. Um, choosing a cooking method that allows for fat to be drained, such as broiling, baking, roasting and barbecuing. So um, where the fat can be drained away, really helpful. And limiting frying and choosing a healthy oil to fry or saute. Next slide, please. What can we do to add to our diets to improve heart health? Because um, as a dietitian for 25 some odd years, like I literally just retired as a registered dietitian, continue to be a nutritionist. Um, so many times when I've gone in to speak with patients or clients and say, hi, I'm your friendly neighborhood dietitian here to talk about heart health. Most people assume that I'm going to be suggesting that they remove all kinds of things from their diets where we can actually add things in that really, really are heart healthy. And these are the foods that really overlap to our brain and our gut health. So fruits and vegetables of all kinds, especially the colorful fruits and vegetables, like and leafy green and leafy greens and berries are really, really up there in the choose more, more often, if you can. Nuts and seeds, if we can incorporate some nuts and seeds every day into our diets, that would really contribute to our heart, brain and bowel health. Foods made from whole grains. So um, you just as an example, you can have a piece of white bread right. that has had all of all of the healthy things about what could be in bread completely removed and then formed into this thing that we call bread and it's white. Then you could have something like a whole wheat bread that's beige, but you don't really see any grains in it or you know anything that looks like how it may have started in a farmer's field. But when you get into whole grains or multi grains, that's where the nutrition that is in that bread or that um, grain product has, um, it's been less processed has more of the natural nutrition and nutrients in it and less things added into it. And then legumes. So legumes are things like um, beans, and I don't mean green beans, but beans like um, say uh, beans and tomato sauce in a can. It could be chickpeas or also known as garbanzo beans or eating hummus, which is made out of chickpeas. Um, lentils, navy beans, kidney beans, um, which could go into a chili, could be a vegetarian chili or a, a lean meat-based chili. So any of the, um, the more denser beans that we consider legumes, if we can incorporate those almost daily into our diets as well, that's really going to contribute to our heart, bowel and uh, brain health. Next slide, please. So money saving tips, I, that this is why I really want to focus on this because it's important always, but as you know, prices are going up like crazy in the grocery stores. Um, Lubed is going to pull up um, my next set of slides. We will step back a bit to go into more detail about the dietary fats, which start on page four. Lubed, no, or yep, right here, this is perfect. And then after we go back and dig a bit deeper into the heart healthy foods that we've just touched on, Lubna will um, go to the section specifically on how can we save money in the grocery store. So strategies for heart health, diet modifications, we know that that's what we're talking about. You knew that before you signed up for today, I'm sure. An increase in activity within your personal limitations, because every single one of us on this presentation today um, have our own limitations, barriers, you know, things we need to be aware of with our, our fitness. And um, I'll be talking to you later about an opportunity that you can look into in order to increase your physical fitness, if that's something that you'd like to do. And management with medication may be required in addition to diet and physical activity when it comes mm -hmm. to managing our heart health and our cholesterol and other blood fat levels. Next slide, please.
So here's where we delve more into the dietary fats, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we know that dietary, the good fats are liquid at room temperature, the oils. We know that good fats contribute to heart and brain health and may decrease the risk for depression or the intensity of the depression if that's a, a challenge that, um, that you live with on a daily basis. There's so much research that talks about the value of nutrition in our moods, um, in depression, in feelings of aggression. Um, it, it's absolutely wild what we put into our bodies. We absolutely are what we eat. And we can modify mood by diet, which just is so exciting. So don't worry about the big word terms like monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. Just really focus on the types of oils and fats that we're talking about. Reflect on your own diet and see where you may be able to change in small steps. We always make, need to make changes or should desire to make changes in very small steps so that we're not setting us up for failure, setting ourselves up for failure if we say, I'm changing my entire diet starting tomorrow. So take a change that you think you can achieve and win it and then choose to move on to the next goal. So monounsaturated fats, some good fats. Olive oil, which is what we use predominantly in my home. Canola oil, oil and walnuts. So if you're gonna to try to incorporate more nuts and seeds into your diet, walnuts are, are really good ones to incorporate and very small amounts in the day are all that you need to get the nutrients from the nuts. Almonds flax and peanuts, and peanut butter as well. Um, other healthy fats, fatty fish, ground flaxseed, oil and walnuts again, and then oils like the soybean, safflower, sunflower, canola, and corn oils. Um, but on a, a, a slide coming up, um, I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a sidebar about some of those other oils like the soybean, safflower, sunflower, corn, and canola. Also want to mention when you say, well, flaxseed, you know, I sprinkle flax seeds on my yogurt or my cereal in the morning. That's fabulous. Great source of a certain type of fiber called soluble fiber, which is a natural stool softener, good for the bowel. But in order to get the really healthy oil out of the flax seed, it needs to be ground. So you could go to the bulk barn or a bulk food store and get it pre-ground. Some people grind their own, like with a coffee grinder or a seed grinder or whatever at home. Um, so however you'd like to do it, please make sure that if you have ground flax seed that you put it in the fridge so that the oil doesn't go rancid. Next slide, please. So omega-3 fats, um, these are really important fats in our diet and in our health. And um, so as an example, um, omega-3 fats, getting adequate or optimal omega-3 fats, decrease triglycerides, which is a type of blood fat that we don't want to be high in our blood levels. We wanna manage our triglyceride levels and omega-3 fats can help do that. Omega-3 fats can help to prevent blood from clotting. So that is great from preventing heart and brain issues like a stroke or a blood clot in the heart um, can help to decrease blood pressure, can help to manage symptoms of irritable and inflammatory bowel disorders. So you can see again how heart, bowel, brain all link in and help with depression, as I mentioned, the, the good fats can do. So the best source, sources of omega-3s are fish sources. So salmon, tuna, anchovies, sardines, herring, mackerel. So basically cold water fish. So when the fish are in cold water, the fish need to have fat on them to keep them warm. And in that fat in those cold water fish is where we find the healthy omega-3 fats. But you might be saying, I hate fish. I can't look at it. I can't pass a piece of fish fillet under my nose like this. So there are other sources of omega-3s. And those are flaxseed oil, again, from grinding the flaxseed, keeping it in the fridge. Um, walnuts, again, if you're incorporating nuts and seeds into your diet, you've got the walnuts in there, which are also going to provide you with omega-3s. 
and um, supplements. Now, as we know, there are omega-3 supplements out on the shelves. I just want to make sure that should you choose to pursue your omega-3s through supplements, that you talk to your diet or your pharmacist, and I'd even recommend actually your pharmacist where you get your medications from, because omega-3 supplementation fats, not through diet, but if you're supplementing with, with omega-3, it can actually um, create bleeding that you don't want. For instance, nosebleeds or other type of bleeding that is unnatural, especially the higher the supplementation gets in omega-3s. So you want to make sure that there's not an interaction with your other medications um, like Coumadin, Warfarin, some of the newer generation blood thinners. Some people are actually um, on aspirin every day um, for, for certain reasons that can help to thin the blood. So just be aware that there can be interactions for sure. Next slide, please. So the bad fats, review from a few minutes ago, these are the saturated ones. These are the ones that are hard at room temperature. So animal sources of fat, meat, poultry, lard, butter fat, dairy product products are not, are not low or um, low fat or fat free, and the tropical oils as we've discussed, hard at room temperature. And remember some of the strategies that we talked about a few minutes ago to eliminate the saturated fat and cholesterol from meats by cutting off visible fat, cooking so that the fat drains away and removing the poultry from, from uh, the poultry, the skin from poultry. Next slide, please. The ugly fats. Da, 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 da. So these are the trans fats in our diet. And there are small amounts of trans fats that exist, exist naturally in natural foods. Those are not the problem. The problem came in when um, the population decided that we wanted convenience foods, fast foods, drive through windows, foods with long shelf lives. Um, which is really unnatural. Sometimes when you buy something and you look at the best before date or, or the shelf life, you go, whoa, like I'm going to be 85 years old by the time I use this up. You think, well, that can't be natural. So um, manufacturers learn to turn healthy fats into ugly trans fats in order to make things last longer on the shelf, fast foods, things that taste really good, like cookies and pastries and french fries. Um, so these are found predominantly in the trans fats in things like what you see on the screen, the french fries and the chips and donuts and pastries, hard stick margarine. So if you use margarine, use a soft tub margarine because they're lower in trans fats because of the manufacturing process. Um, when, if you're a label reader, when you go to the grocery store or if somebody does your groceries for you, Ask them to take a peek at the list of ingredients, because if um, on the list of ingredients, the word hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated is there, that term hydrogenated means that a good fat has been turned into an ugly trans fat, and um, it is not good for the heart at all, and there's trans fats in that product. And there's actually no safe levels of trans fats in our diet, so where we can avoid them we should avoid them. Good news is that manufacturers aware, are aware that consumers are more aware and demanding fewer trans fats in the foods that we eat. Next slide, please. So omega-6 fats. Um, so on that slide that talked about the unsaturated fats that showed like the corn oil, soy, soybean oil, safflower oil, those are predominantly omega-6 fats. Yes, they're oils and they're liquid at room temperature. So there's def definite heart healthy properties in those to be sure. But there are a lot of omega-6 sources in our food supply as it is. So we don't necessarily want to be increasing our intake of items that contain the omega-6s, um, which are found in the corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, very abundant in our food supply. So if you, um, you're in the grocery store or the person who does your groceries for you, um, 
is going out to get an oil, I would prefer that the choice be olive oil or um, even canola oil um, and, and not these ones. Don't supplement with omega-6 fats or increase your use of omega-6 dietary sources. So when we talked about omega-3 supplements, you can, you go down that aisle and there'll be a bottle of omega-3s. And probably right next to it, there'll be a bottle of omega-3, 6, 9. Omega-9s are good, avocados and things, but I have no idea why a manufacturer would include omega-6s in a supplement. So if after talking to your doctor and or pharmacist, you choose to supplement with omega-3s, um, make sure it's just the omega-3 you're getting and not the omega-3, 6, 9. Um, an imbalance of omega-6 to omega-3 can result in inflammation and pain. So at the very beginning, we talked about how nutrition can either increase or decrease the invisible inflammation that goes on in our bodies that can underlie a lot of preventable chronic diseases. And omega-6s, because of how they work in the body, can actually trigger our pain receptors, so to speak. Um, so again, just um, choose your oils wisely, preferably not the ones that contain large amounts of omega-6s, and do what you can to increase your omega-3s. Um, and so we're seeing some of our, our sources options, olive oil and olives, almonds, avocado, to achieve anti-inflammatory benefits. And not just these, but colorful fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, berries, certain herbs, um, herbs and spices like turmeric and um, garlic, all of these things can help with the inflammatory processes in our bodies to help with chronic pain and to help lower our risk for preventable chronic diseases. Next slide, please. So we, we know this rule of thumb now. Next slide, please. Other heart healthy foods. Um, so these are the things that you can add into your diets rather than removing from. So soluble fiber, I mentioned that when we were talking about legumes like the beans and tomato sauce in the can, kidney beans, chickpeas that turn into hummus, lentils, those types of things. They also are an excellent source of soluble fiber, natural stool softener, good for the gut, though incorporate slowly because it can cause gas or stools that are too soft that will make bowel care a nightmare. But other sources of, of, of soluble fiber that are great for heart health, oatmeal, oat bran, psyllium, flaxseed, the lentils and legumes, barley, apples, strawberries, pears, citrus fruits, and other fruit and vegetables. Plant sterols and phytosterols, again, don't worry about the terms, just focus on the foods that you can choose. The vegetable oils, preferably like the olive oil, canola oil, um, nuts, seeds, and legumes, especially soybeans. So you're really starting to see the overlap in the heart, gut, brain, health, and the foods that we choose. So choosing one food won't just help for our brain and another one for our heart, and another one for our bowel, like literally three bangs for our buck by choosing these types of foods. And then foods like cooked, cooked tomato products, especially red and orange vegetables, watermelon, pink grapefruit and guava, as an example, are um, sources of the carotenoids that are really heart healthy. Um, but again, you say, well, you know, this is a pretty limited list. If you're going for the bright color fruits and vegetables, dark greens, reds, oranges, you're going to be getting these good nutrients. Next slide, please. Oh, oh here we go. Thank you. Um, green and black teas. So if you are a tea drinker, that can be a good thing. In, unless you put in like 18% table cream into your tea or things like that. But on their own, green tea, it does contain caffeine, by the way, if you're just wondering about caffeine. Um, some people think green tea is caffeine free. It's not. It's naturally caffeinated. But green and black teas on their own um, are, are very good for heart health. 
onions and broccoli. Food sources of some B vitamins. B vitamins do lots of things in our bodies in terms of energy and all kinds of things. In addition to heart health, green leafy vegetables, fruits, legumes, lentils, nuts, wheat germ, liver. I wouldn't necessarily go to liver as your source of um, B vitamins when we're talking about heart health and saturated fats in, in, in uh, reasonable amounts, maybe once a month, but I should probably modify this slide. Soy flour, whole grains, multi-grains, more, more likely, more like the way our grains come off of the farmer's field than totally processed. Fortified breads and cereals, meaning that um, the breads and cereals we choose have had nutrients added back in, B vitamins added back in, and lean animal sources. And then things like soy milk, tofu, soy flour, roasted soy nuts and miso, which is like a, a fermented product, um, is also good for heart health. Um, I do need to say though that, um, and I, I am not a breast cancer specialist by any stretch of the imagination, but certain breast cancers um, it are, it require that um, soy products be really minimized or eliminated almost. Um, again, I don't know the detail behind that, but it's the, the sort of the biochemical form of soy and how it can interact with certain types of breast cancers. So just to keep that as, as an aside. And incorporating more meatless meals, plant-based meals. Um, as long as the plant-based product that you're choosing isn't a highly processed one. Um, be, because once you get into processing, you're, you're getting into things that have been added and removed in the processing process. Next slide, please. So what do we do? Replace the bad fats in your diet with the good fats. Consume other heart healthy foods daily. You can take a look at um, the Mediterranean diet on, on your own. If you get a chance, just Google Mediterranean diet and you'll see um, a lot of these ideas incorporated. Mediterranean diet is um, probably the, one of the, the better dietary patterns to follow for heart health, brain health, and inflammation. Attempt to maintain a healthy body weight, increase your physical activity within your, your, own, your own limits and, um, and with the input of your doctor, physiotherapist, and ask your daughter to do a, it at minimum a yearly blood test. Super important. Um, I always tell people to know your numbers, whether it's your blood sugars, your cholesterol, your vitamin D level, certain things. So um, it's the total cholesterol, the LDL, the HDL, the triglycerides, and some ratios um, that will be within what I call the, the lipid profile and also checking your blood pressure. Um, so Lubna, can you just um, flip to page 43, please? And we'll just talk about um, eating on a budget. And then I promise I will stop talking and uh, we'll hear Joan's amazing story. This is it, right, Grace? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't see it flip. Oh my gosh. Oh, talk about awareness. I need to become more mindful. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I've kind of um, broken the um, best buys or the food group into what I refer as best buys. So in the meat and the meat alternates category, meat alternates are non-meat sources of protein, basically. So that can be the legumes, the nuts, the seeds, um, things like that. So plain frozen fish is less expensive than fresh or breaded fish. I always have frozen fish in the freezer. I rely a lot on frozen foods, especially seasonally. Dried canned beans and lentils, peanut butter, eggs, regular ground beef. Um, so when you get your ground beef or ground meats, turkey, um, pork, whatever, you can get the lean and the extra lean. It's going to cost you more money for lean and extra lean. So if you get the regular ground meat and just drain the extra fat off for longer, to get rid of that fat. Canned tuna, flaked is less expensive than chunk or solid. And in fact, a little bit healthier from a toxin perspective. 
So canned flaked tuna water packed is always in my in my cupboard. But um, if it's packed in its oil, it's still a, a healthy fat. So so your choice, choose the flaked. Um, utility grade chicken. The chickens that we buy aren't going to be on like a runway modeling the latest in hope couture. So if it's missing a leg or a wing or something, who cares? That's the only thing that's different. It's not different in quality and a lot less expensive to get utility grade chicken. Blade roast, rump roast, pot roast, and stewing beef are cuts of meats that are less expensive as well. Some may be a little bit tougher, so you may want to put them into stew and other um, things where there's liquid and moisture or sauces to make it um, to make some of those meat cuts a little bit more tender. In some cases, um, well, basically that that's the case. So you can have your cuts of meat. Different cuts um, are on on different price price grades. Next slide, please. So the milk products, the best buys in the milk product um, category, skim milk powder, evaporated milk, cheddar and mozzarella cheese. And I haven't noticed this lately, but sometimes old cheese will be more expensive than mild or medium. So if you're price matching on your phone or on your tablet or on your computer, or if you're like a, a paper flyer coupon person looking at the sales, take a look at that. I always thought that was so strange that old cheese would be more expensive. I don't see that happening as often, to just, but just be cognizant of that. Plain, lo, yo, plain yogurt and fluid milk. Um, skim milk powder, a little sidebar on that, is that it contains protein, it contains the milk protein. So you can, if you're looking to up the protein in your diet in, in uh, an inexpensive budget friendly way, you can mix your skim milk powder into your fluid milk to make it a higher protein milk. You can mix it into your yogurts. You can mix it into cream sauces if you're doing a casserole. You can mix it into a lot of things to up the protein content budget in a budget friendly way by using skim milk powder. Choose, and this goes for anything, choosing store brand over name brands. No difference in quality at all, far less expensive. Bagged milk is a better value than cartons. Hmm, might not have known that. Buy plain yogurt and add your own fruit, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. So now you know you're going to be looking to increasing nuts and seeds into your diet and fruits. So um, getting the plain yogurt rather than the, having like the fruit on the bottom or all the stuff mixed into it, a lot less expensive. Next slide, please. Fruits and vegetables, best buys, apples, bananas, oranges, grapefruit, cabbage, potatoes, carrots, turnip, rhubarb, plain frozen vegetables. Those are the best buys um, in, in fruits and vegetables. Of course, it's seasonal for sure. Um, the th nice thing about cabbage is that it's less expensive than lettuce and far more nutritious. The amount of vitamin C in cabbage, massive, minimal in lettuce. Buy local and fresh when in season, frozen vegetables and fruits when out of season. As I mentioned, I have frozen fruits and vegetables all year round in my freezer. And so they don't rot in the crisper, which is nice. They're available all year round. You can get them mixed or, or your favorite your favorite types of fruits and vegetables and they last and they're great. Mm -hmm. Watch and cut your own produce. You know, the ones that if you're getting like the pre-cut up fruit and vegetable trays, humongously expensive. I think like 15 bucks now at the grocery store that I go to. And uh, oh, I mentioned about cabbage. Next slide, please. And I, I'm cognizant of time. I'm very sorry. I, I will be wrapping up. Grains, whole grain rice, rolled oats, hot cereals are our best buys in this category. Purchase day old whole grain breads and freeze. All of our grain products, breads, um, bagels, things like that are always in our freezer. Even, you know, like raisin bran muffins, I freeze them and just take them out as needed. You don't have them going moldy and bad. 
whole grain cereals are less expensive than pre-sweetened cereals. Wow, way more, way more healthy as well. And cereals that you cook are less expensive than ready to eat. Next slide, please. Use coupons or price matching. I, I am not very techy, so I tend to price match in the store or with flyers. If um, you're going to work or school or volunteering, pack your lunches and snacks rather than buying amazing savings. Do the math sometime and just see how much it's costing you to grab that, that coffee on your way to work or school. Fast food pickup and delivery, far more expensive than um, buying at the grocery store and cooking at home, uh, especially with the delivery companies now where you're paying and then you're paying and then you're paying on top and packing meals and snacks in reusable containers to save money on disposable bags, way better for the environment as well. I think that is the last slide in this section. Thank you everyone. I, I'm sorry that I went as long as I did. Um, you're going to love Joan's story, super inspiring. And uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay. Joan, do you want to take it from here? Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story and, and the kinds of things that I have done over the years and continue to do today um, to maintain my own physical and mental well-being as well. Um, I stained a T12 L1 spinal cord injury in 1975 when I was 23 years old, um, about 47 years ago. And, um, and now I've retired as well. I'm a retired occupational therapist. I worked in mental health and addictions for most of my career. Um, and my drive these days is to exercise in exercising is to stay healthy and control my weight as much as possible so I can do the things that I most enjoy and love because really that's what it's all about. So living and aging with a spinal cord injury means constantly adapting to change as does as it does for most people in life really. Um, and here are some examples of how I've changed my activities over the years. In my younger days, I participated in archery on a competitive level. However, once I graduated from university and started working full-time in a demanding job, I wanted to do, to do a sport just for pleasure and recreation. And so I took up kayaking. When I started developing neck and shoulder problems a few years later, I switched to sailing with the Disabled Sailing Association of Ontario. I really enjoyed this for a number of years and to problems with my shoulders progressed to the degree that I needed to have total shoulder replacements done. <clears throat> and that took place um, three and five years ago, approximately. At this point, and partly due to retirement, I uh, changed up my activities again I love to be out in nature and I love to learn. So I joined the Toronto Field Naturalists who offer about 140 guided walks and lectures every year. I've assisted them to develop walk descriptions that contain accessibility information. So you can know in advance whether or not a particular nature walk or heritage walk um, is going to be accessible and meet your particular needs. <clears throat> um, after the pandemic and with two new strong shoulders, I returned to sailing in 2022, this time at the Disabled Sailing uh, or Able Sail Toronto, I should say, located at the National Yacht Club in Toronto. To keep active and fit during the pandemic, a friend and I messaged each other most mornings and confirmed whether we were both available to exercise that day. She was in Newfoundland over the winter, and at the beginning of the pandemic, she was in Portugal. So no matter where it was that we were geographically, 
we were able to connect online. And that's really, I have found, changed things up quite a bit. I find something that really makes a difference for me to stay motivated in exercising is to be able to connect with other people in that process. So being able to do things on that line, online really has, um, has really helped with my motivation to stay involved with exercise. And our goal at that time was to exercise three to four times a week. We connected on Messenger so that we could see each other on our phones, and we played an exercise video on our tablets that we followed together. And we're continuing to do that, um, not quite as consistently right now, um, <clears throat> because our circumstances have changed, but we are doing that to some extent. We did neck and shoulder exercises, uh, stretches and strengthening exercises, followed by some aerobics. And um, <clears throat> and then in 2022, um, I've continued to with exercising with that friend occasionally and also joined a yoga class that I do online weekly. And that was a yoga class I discovered through one of these peer connection um, uh, presentations. And uh, there's a, a group that I've connected with that, that does that online weekly. I've also since then, um, I joined uh, a fellow to do a boxer size class on about every two weeks. And I have videos that we've done of those exercise classes. And I do those on my own in that two week period in between when we, when we meet live on, on uh, Zoom. <clears throat> I also practice mindfulness-based stress reduction. At the moment, not as, consistency, as consistently as I would like. I'm kind of on and off with it. But it's a form of meditation that helps to manage anxiety that comes with always having to adapt to impose changes. I believe our physical and mental health are intricately related. I strive to do whatever I can to stay healthy and mobile enough that I can continue experiencing the engaging activities and people that bring me joy. The long and the short of it is that I've found it's important to stay connected with others so as to learn of various opportunities to stay active both socially and physically. And over time, as abilities, mobility of devices, and opportunities change, so do my activities. So things are ever evolving. They never stay static, which brings its own challenges, of course. People are not, don't easily adapt to change, I don't think, but it's certainly some, the one thing in life I have found is that things constantly do change, whether we like it or not. So learning how to, to roll with that, um, whether it's geographical changes, whether it's physical changes, whether it's changes in your mobility devices or your abilities. Um, there are always new things to learn and new things to discover. And I find that learning really keeps me motivated as well. So I'll leave it there for now. Joyce, Thank you. raise your hand. Do you want to prompt question right now or do you want to wait till later? Sure, questions are fine. Um, I'm a quadriplegic, level uh, C3. And so I'm an incomplete, and I am able to walk short distances with my walker. However, I can't do, like I could never get into a kayak or a sailboat or anything like that. But how do you find out what is available for somebody who needs it? Um, <clears throat> actually, I, I have known two people that sail who are not able to move. They have very, very high level injuries and they're not able to move anything but their head. And they have sailed using sip and puff technology. Um, and there are two organizations in Toronto that may have those facilities or can make them available, that, that technology. 
<laughs> and one of the fellows I've known, he um, he lives in Montreal, so I I'm sure that they have that technology there as well. Yeah, I think the but, problem is that I live in London, and we don't right. have a lake at our doorstep, and so like I would love to be able to get into the water again at the yeah. beach. I love the beach, but yeah. it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I mean the. You know, you just, I find I really have to do research all the time, whether it's talking with people or whether it's doing research online, um, that that's where I have found out about things. I learned about sailing through reading about it in the, um, what was then called the CPA magazine, the Canadian Paraplegic Association magazine when the club first opened up in Toronto in 1999 and then it was in the year 2000 that I that I took up sailing so it's a matter of digging and connecting with people to really learn about the resources that are available in your community and sometimes um, and I'm sometimes sorry, I'm going to inter uh, interject for a real quick second Joyce um, yeah. I think Julie can connect you, introduce you to Rick Waters. He's a member on the peer team who I think sits on the board of the Disabled Sailing um, uh, Organization here in Toronto, but he does sail all over the province. He also lives out, out of a power wheelchair. He would be the best individual to, to, to make that connection. So at some I point, Julie, Sorry, Julie, I didn't going to introduce you. Julie will introduce you to him. Okay, thanks. Joyce, I also think that there is something in London. You and I can chat after um, that. I know someone's a part of at Fanshawe Park, like Fanshawe that, Conservation. Yeah. Is that you, Julie? Yeah. Hi, Joyce. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, do you, do you know about that too? Yeah. Hi, Joyce. Um, Hi. It's through an organization called Abilities in Motion, mm -hmm. and um, they give people opportunities to try um, accessible kayaking. I did it last summer and loved it. There were people of all levels of ability and disability. There was a blind gentleman um, and they have a, a lift and they have a lift and stabilizers on the kayak. So you don't flip upside down. You can get a high back for support. And it's a really yeah. cool opportunity to try and get out on the water. So um, <laughs> It's super it's cool. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So right. I, I well, can give you more up. information about that too. But if you guys want to Google abilities in motion, you'll okay. get all kinds of cool information. True. That's terrific. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay. Does anyone have, I don't know, Chris, do you maybe want to just quickly talk about um the fitness program, and then we can go back to questions for you and Joan. Sure, if that works for everybody. Um, so at, I'm here in London, Ontario, and Parkwood Institute is um, the Regional Rehabilitation Centre for Southwestern Ontario. And over the past few years, um, especially at the start of COVID, we've been working really, really hard on virtual fitness opportunities. So here we are, and we have an opportunity we call the Park Parkwood Virtual Fitness Center Pilot. And if you want to have this poster sent to you afterwards, um, let the, the folks from SCIO know, because under participation request on your screen, it's a live link where you self-register and just sign up yourself. And it's, it's super cool. Um, so who can participate? Anyone with a disability and or mo mobility impairment living in Ontario. We offer five classes a week right now, which may increase as the demand increases. There's boxer size led by the same instructor that um, Joan does boxer size with that she talked about. Um, gentle fitness, which uh, is going to be called full body fitness, same instructor and movements, just a different name. Seated aerobics, which I lead a seated hit yoga, which seems like an oxymoron, but it's kind of a high intensity yoga using some of the traditional yoga techniques and a seated yoga, which is more traditional. 
Um, we offer these at, um, so Monday to Friday, there's different options at different times of day. Um, and the contact information is there and, and on the, the poster if you request it. What's um, one of the things that's really cool is that we have spotters in every class and they tend to be fourth year um, students from Western and the rehabilitation sciences or kinesiology that have been trained by us. And um, so there's the instructor on there. So they're, they're live classes with the instructor and the spotter and with groups of people. So, you know, when Joan said it's the interaction and working out with somebody, even if you're not in the same room or out in the park, it's being, it's working out together. So it's the accountability for yourself, accountability to others to show up and it's fun and it's social. So our spotters keep an eye on everybody as do the instructors in case somebody, you know, runs into a bit of an issue or doesn't look well, but more importantly, because everybody has different levels of ability and disability, the spotters will demonstrate lower, slower, different modifications to something that the instructor may be doing. So we're always suggesting modifications, whether or not somebody's mobility is impaired or has a bad shoulder at the moment or whatever. And um, it, it's, it's free of charge at the moment, hoping to keep it that way. So anyways, um, we're really excited about it and it's really fun. And some of the gains that people share in the classes since they've been just more physically active are, are really inspiring. Thanks, Chris. I've heard, I think I've told you this before, I've heard from a lot of people that really, really enjoy it. So um, hopefully you'll get more joiners. Uh, Phil, you've got a question? Yeah, I was just gonna pipe in. Hi, Chris, it's Phil. Hey, Phil. How are you? Good, how are I you? I just uh, wanted to pipe in too with the fitness. It's uh, absolutely life-changing. Um, I started uh, about a year and a half ago with the study and uh, we continued it on and then Parkwood's taking it on for us and I'm doing five days a week, actually six days this week because uh, at four o'clock, there's another class. Uh, they're doing a strength training class. Uh, for a few weeks so um, I'm going to be popping into that in a couple minutes but I, I would encourage anybody out there that's uh, looking to exercise you can start out slow and just move your way up like we've done but it's uh, it's absolute life-changing it's uh, been fantastic thanks Phil. thanks um, Phil. My, if I might just say one thing to that I I was able to be the part of the last part of this study um, but the issues often are timing. Mm. So mornings are not good for me because I have PSWs. And so it just, it would be helpful just to mention this, to have, uh, some afternoon classes. Yeah. Yes. And, and Joyce, thank you for that. Um, the study that Phil and Joyce are referring to was a, a physical activity research study separate from this, but then flowed into mm -hmm. the virtual fitness center for those who wanted to continue to participate. And we are trying to modify times that um, work out for as many people as possible. Um, when you do get the poster in the click on under participation request, we actually have a section in there saying what times would work best for you. So at such time, we have the capacity to add classes or change times we will based on on request the the majority of the classes though i believe are all in the afternoon now with this new four o'clock one starting joyce yeah on, oh, okay. well, i'll look at it again then thanks yeah thank you but that's a really important point because it has to work for people's <laughs> schedules for sure yeah, that's right chris i have some questions about diet is that okay sure okay I use avocado oil frequently. Is that, I, I think it's a good oil, but. It is an excellent oil, Joyce. So excellent is it better oil. than olive oil? Um, it's, it, it has more omega-9s in it. So basically, if you're getting omega-3s from some places, if you use olive oil, sometimes you're getting omega-3s from other right. sources in your diet. And then using avocado oil as your main oil, that is a fabulous combination because okay. it's increasing your omega-3s and 9s 
decreasing the ratio of the omega sixes that cause can relate or can um, result in inflammation and pain. Right. Okay. It's an awesome oil. Yeah. Yeah. So I am using omega three. Um, I only, I mean, I think it's a good thing because I do have issues with inflammatory bowel. And so I thought that I was doing a good thing to be taking it. And yeah. the only issue I've ever had is with my stool <laughs> because I tend to have loose stool, as you know. So I wondered about that. What do you think about the omega-3? Um, Omega-3s, like oils in general, should not be contributing in any way to stool form, um, whether it be, be hard or too soft or loose. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you and I have talked, you know, at, at yeah. length, um, Joyce, other things that would be more likely to contribute to that as well. But no, your oil choices are super healthy. And I know that you don't overdo anything. And um, that would not be contributing from, from my perspective at all. All right. One more question. Muffins, you said, were not good. But if you're making your own muffins and you're using olive oil or avocado oil in the process, that would be fine, right? Definitely. And, and I don't know if I said muffins aren't good. Anything, though, anything store-bought... No. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Um, store bought is likely to have um, not as healthy fats as homemade um, yeah. things like that. But but yeah, um, label read for sure. Yeah. If, if you're not a, a home cook or don't have somebody that cooks and bakes. But um, Joyce, that's yeah. amazing. If you're doing your homemade muffins yeah. um, with the type of fiber that you know works for you, yes. the healthy fats you know, incorporating fruits, grains that, that work for you. That's amazing. I do all that. Question I, about- I, And I know that, and I, I love that about you. I have and a question others. about mac, macaroni and cheese. Uh -huh. Run, I'm everybody. Ready? Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Bye, Sorry, Phil. I the next class. Bye, bye, bye guys. Phil. Thanks. Take bye. care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Um, I wondered if I made my own mac and cheese is- that a healthy food choice? Um, you would buy you would buy the noodles, though, right, Joyce? Of course, yes. So, um, you know, if, if it's like the the white macaroni noodles, um, white grain products like white pasta, white bread, white yeah. bagels, white anything. Um, I've got very little in them. Very little in them, and and aren't aren't super. Uh, they might, they can either be zero nutrition value or even negative, but, you know, we don't want to eliminate completely things that we enjoy out of our diets. So um, if you're making mac and cheese, you're having a craving. I know your diet is super healthy in every other way. Um, if you're making it with your own cheese that, that you know that you yes. can tolerate and you know what's going into it, that of course would be a, a better way of doing mac and cheese than the the box okay. stuff but you might be able to find whole grain um noodles or yeah noodles that are made from other sources yeah absolutely like and and there are some noodles that are actually made out of legumes and not just like a, yeah. a, a brown a brown grain yep so yeah. you can try a legume based noodle that's a great idea that's great i've tried the chickpea um penne pasta and I really like them I mean it's, oh. it's definitely got a bit of a different taste but I thought they were really good where do you get those Julie I think anywhere I mean I know I've seen them at like a Sunripe and a okay. Remark but I think the grocery stores I don't know Chris if you know carry them they, they come in a box as opposed to a like a bag from what I've seen yeah yeah have you seen them Chris I'm um, I believe I have at the, the Metro in Byron, Joyce. I see Joan shaking her head or nodding her head as well. Joan, do you have something to add to that as well? Yeah, I, um, I have celiac disease, so I um, don't eat anything related to wheat. But um, there are some, some quite healthy uh, wheat-free uh, uh, pastas that I use that have nothing but brown rice and, and wild rice in them. 
So that's another option as well. Yes. That's and great. are you able to get those at regular grocery stores, John? Or do you get uh, them? Yes. From, yeah. 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 Thank you. And, yeah, that's good. That's I the end have of my question as well, Julie. I'm I'm presuming that not all lettuces are are the same, that some have, are more nutritious than others. So I wanted to ask about arugula. Is arugula more nutritious than, than say, romaine lettuce or um, the round <laughs> lettuce that I, I never eat anymore, but would it be more nutritious? Yeah, any type of lettuce is more nutrition than iceberg lettuce. Iceberg lettuce is just a filler. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head a comparison between romaine and arugula. I know that they are both, both very healthy because they fall into sort of like the, the dark greens and the leafies and, and like the more colored ones. I could do a comparison between the two, but they would both be very good choices. Very good choice. Not iceberg. Nice You're buying water and some <laughs> Yeah, country <laughs> water. So, Chris, I'm I'm did you speak about flaxseed? And I know I hear a lot about chia seeds too. Could you like speak to me from like the point of view of heart health, what the differences are and, and if there is a preference for one over the other? And I have a second question, which is I am diabetic. And when you say fruits, can you like sort of guide me on which fruits are, have lower glycemic index, which are still great for heart health? Like what is like my, Top, top choices as someone who, who wants to avoid heart health and I mean issue heart issues and want to maintain like low glycemic index yeah yeah the, those are great questions so I'll start with the flax seed chia seed um, question and so the flax seeds um, are kind of have um, two two things going for them when it comes to heart health First of all, um, flax seed is a really good, good source of soluble fiber. We know that soluble fiber actually helps to absorb cholesterol and sugar in the digestive system when consumed. And, um, or sorry, it doesn't absorb it into our bloodstream. It keeps it into our digestive system and carries it out. So not 100% of cholesterol and sugar, obviously, in a meal would carry out of our body if we're eating flaxseed or other sources of soluble fiber. But we do know that any source of soluble fiber has that ability to carry cholesterol and sugar out of our systems before it gets into our bloodstream. So that's one of the benefits of flaxseed. Um, the other benefit of flaxseed is that it, when ground and digested, it can go through certain processes in the body that turn it into something very similar to omega-3. So if you're saying, you know, I hate salmon or I hate all fish, I want to increase my omega-3 intake through diet, flaxseed is a good way to do it. The only thing is you need to eat a lot of non-fish foods, flaxseed, walnuts, other things, in order to get the same amount of like the omega-3 activity as you would in a piece of salmon, but it's still there. And if we're making beneficial changes in our diets in many, many ways, every small change can come together to be heart healthy, brain healthy, gut healthy. Chia seeds are also a really good source of soluble fiber. So as I say, any source of soluble fiber will do what flaxseed does or another great source of soluble fiber is oatmeal, oat bran, like the oat products which will help to decrease cholesterol and sugar absorption from your digestive system into your bloodstream. A sidebar about soluble fiber, it is a natural stool softener. Um, and as those of us know who have to do bowel care, the form of our stool can make or break our quality of life, <laughs> literally. And um, so not all fiber is created equal. So if you find that your stool is mushy, soft, like too, too mushy to really get out through disimpaction, digital stimulation, all of that, um, then you may want to back off on your amount of soluble fiber you're taking 
and eat different types of fiber, but that we could fill an hour and a half on fiber and bowel management. But I just wanted to let you know that soluble fiber sources can, can overdo the softness of our stool and make it mushy and really hard to manage. Um, so the, your question about the diabetes, Lubna, um, so, and I, I'm sure that you know, because you've talked about glycemic index, is that um, fruits aren't taboo on a diabetic diet. We need fruits on our diet. And so not for, for your benefit, Lubna, but for other people who may um, be new diabetics or diabetics who don't, you know, maybe need a little bit of a refresh, um, is that it's really the total amount of carbohydrate, sugar, throughout the day distributed in ways that work for our body and the amounts at each meal, how it's distributed throughout the day, but also the sources that we choose. Um, there is something called glycemic index and all of us, whether we have diabetes or not, um, should probably be choosing, not probably, should be choosing, in my opinion, lower glycemic index foods because they are less likely to put a spike into your blood sugars. They're more likely to have your blood sugars maintained level on a regular basis, which helps with mood, with energy, rather than the peaks and valleys. And um, also the effect on a brain chemical called serotonin that really affects mood and sleep and all of that sort of thing. Um, it also, for those of us who have limitations in pursuing physical activity and who want to maintain or lose weight, low glycemic energy foods will put our body more into burn mode. High glycemic index foods put our bodies more into store mode. Um, and Julie, I'm just wondering um, if, if I share a document that I put together um, based on the glycemic index diet, which is, I just modified it. I, I have it referenced. I can't take credit for it, but I sort of took it from a book into a few pages of guidelines for people to follow. Would I be able to send that to you and you could distribute it to the participants today? Is that possible? Absolutely. Okay, that would yep. be great. And then um, Lubna, then that would also answer your question. And it's all, it's not just fruits, but it's foods in different food groups that are low, medium and high glycemic index. And the way the glycemic index diet um, has put it together um, is, is I think like red stop, well, just kind of like a stop sign, you know, really try to avoid, minimize, and, you know, you can be more liberal with certain foods. And I, when I've taught the glycemic index diet to people when I was working at Parkwood in spinal cord injury and brain injury, who had very high level um, injuries, who were able to move less of their bodies than somebody with a lower level of injury, but were struggling with weight. Mm -hmm. The glycemic index diet was helpful because A, it's not a fad diet. You don't eliminate any food groups or whatever. You're still eating all of the food groups, but in a way that's making your body burn more calories than store. So um, I'll, I'll get that information to Julie to distribute to everybody. Thank you. Those are good questions, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Does anyone else have any questions for Chris or Joan? Feel free just to unmute yourself if, if you do. No? Can I just say that it is always so uplifting to be at, amongst others who also live with spinal cord injury because when Chris just said that, you know, <laughs> the consistency of your stools can have such an impact on your quality of life, like, like I, I'm like my whole body's like yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah so, we you. all know what we're talking about yeah, we, all we can what relate we're about it's like you know others like I have two mortal fears the first one is to say something that really makes me look very unintelligent and the second fear is Oh my God, my bowel and bladder just cooperate when I'm out in public. Do not embarrass me. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> you know, that's the same way people have colostomies feel as well. Yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, I am definitely inclusive of that group in my comments. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> 
Chris, would you be able to send out um, a list of fruits that are low glycemic index? Yes, absolutely. That will be included in um, oh. the, 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 summary, the summary of the glycemic index diet, Joyce, that um, Julie will send to the group or, um, and you know where to find me, Joyce, for sure. I do. <laughs> I'll be at your door. Yeah. Well, we're right <laughs> around the corner. <laughs> okay, so I just caught us another time. I'm thank you so much, Chris and Joan, for like sharing all of your information and Joan sharing your lived experience. Um, I also want to thank um, who I forgot the last couple of times, Cheryl Cordner. So she is our manager of meditation and training services for SCIO, and she has done. Um, she's helped develop all of these courses and um, helped to get all of our guest speakers for our presentations as well. So thank you, Cheryl, for all the work you've put in. And then just our local sponsor, our, our provincial partner, um, the Insurance Bureau of Canada and Hollister Inc., who is our provincial bowel and bladder, as well as our vehicle modification sponsors. And then we've got regional sponsors as well. I'd like to thank Learners Lawyers uh, and Mackenzie Lake Lawyers as well. So again, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate you staying. Um, we hope to see you at our next Peer Connections and enjoy the rest of your, your evenings. And, thank you so much. Lead, uh, I know you're going into your uh, weekend right now. Can I just take a minute to just thank Julie? She does this so beautifully with all the internet issues that she was having. This was so well done. Julie, just wanted to remind you there is that one outstanding email, <laughs> if you could. CP, but if you could just do that before you leave for the weekend, please. The email? Yeah, the, uh, the invoice. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you, Nina. I will be editing all of this out of the video. <laughs> okay. I look forward to seeing your link.